Now what's happening today is that there are conflicts, always have been conflicts, and who knows how long the conflicts will remain. Most conflicts in the world are political. They have some sort of a political element. And the conflicts that are taking place in the Middle East are no different. Many of them are old, some are new, all of them are very complicated and sophisticated. There is no one recipe solution to all of this. And as in all major conflicts of the world, a great deal of harm and damage has come to thousands and thousands of people and families. And nations have been uprooted and thrown into turmoil. And so it becomes necessary to find solutions. Somehow, out of the blue you have people who say, you know what? This is a religious conflict. And now we're taking matters into our own hands and we want to do something in the name of Islam. But if you were to look at it from a very simple and logical perspective, you'd say, well, wait a minute. Aren't those countries already Muslim? Like, isn't Syria already a Muslim country by and large? You do have Christians. You have a large population of Christians in Syria. They've always been there. But don't you have this massive population of, of Muslims there? And isn't it the same in Iraq? So where is the religious conflict? What is it exactly you're trying to prove? No, 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 we need to carry out jihad for the sake of Islam. Okay, but for what? And so you have this rogue group that comes out and just starts killing people and taking land, and taking property. And expanding, expanding, expanding until they are where they are today. The thing that bothers us the most is why are you using the name of Islam? If you want to be an invader or call yourself a conqueror of some sort, a hero of some sort, you think you're fighting for some cause, that's your cause. But why are you presenting it as if this is what Islam wants from you? Or as if this is what Islam wants from us? Where do you get that from? And I like to give the example of a group of us having an issue or many issues against a certain country. And we're just fed up, we've had it up to here. And you know what guys, we're going in. We're going to go invade them. Because we're just sick and tired of them. And so we get our hands on some weapons. And we declare war on behalf of Canada on that country. We say, that's it, it's official. As Canadians, we feel compelled to wage war against such and such and such things of that country. And that's it. Canada is at war. Now what's going to happen? Canadians are going to say, excuse me? Say what? Which Canada are you talking about? And who said? We have a process that decides whether Canada is at war or not. We have a process that decides whether our forces are going to be deployed or not. Who the heck do you think you are? And if we were to actually go and carry out an attack on another country in the name of Canada, we would be deemed as criminals by Canada and by the other country and we would be apprehended by both. Because we took the name of an official entity, we hijacked the name for our own concerns or for our own whatever it was and we have used it. And the country will never forgive us for doing that. And that's like the scenario we have today. And what bothers us, what hurts us the most, is that it's not fair. It's not fair to Muslims. Because 
Muslims have already lost more lives to terrorist attacks than any other faith group. How many bombs do you think have gone off, operated by suicide bombers, in Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Iraq? Just these three countries. How many people have been killed by suicide attacks in just these three places? And who were they? They were Muslims. The Muslims get killed by the terrorists, and then they get carpet bombed by the people that are chasing the terrorists, and they get killed from both sides. Nobody is hurt worse than Muslims by acts of violent extremism, either by direct consequence or indirect consequence. Who did ISIS have to kill in order to gain that territory that they have? By and large, they were Muslims. Who are the bombs falling on today? that the coalition is, is dropping, who are they? By and large, they're Muslims. We get hurt from both sides. And that's just the beginning of it. The stigma that is attached to the name of Islam, or to Muslim names, or to anyone with an Islamic affiliation, Islamic institutions, mosques, schools, non-profit organizations. The harassment, that our children have to go through, standing at the bus stop, in the mall, at school, people applying for jobs, people trying to travel, it's a bloody embarrassment sometimes. Having your name match with some, some dude on some no-fly list, there's a name match. Like I was reading in the newspaper about a couple that was traveling with, a, with their two-month-old baby. And at the airport, they told them, well, you guys are okay, but your baby can't travel. Why is that? He's on the no-fly list. They're like, what? He's on no... Well, okay, it must be a name match. Well, sorry. And the guards come in, and they're surrounded by all of these guards, and it's a, it's a gong show. Thoroughly embarrassed in front of the whole airport, and being made to wait there for three hours and then say, okay, we've cleared him, he can go. They say, you know what, we're not traveling now. It's happening every day. And worse. So we are always the one who suffer. And I wish somebody could explain to these people, the people that are promoting violence with so much, with so much rigor, that you're doing nothing for the sake of Islam. All you're doing is hurting us. At every level. You've damaged and shattered our collective image. And you continue to be one of the greatest obstacles in the path of Islam and Muslims today. And that's where this campaign comes in. We started this campaign for Muslims, not for non-Muslims. As Hamza was mentioning in the beginning, we ran many, many programs for the Muslim community, for youth, in mosques, during Friday sermons, special conferences just to educate the Muslims about these issues. Because just like you people, just like the non-Muslim audience is bewildered, but what is this? The Muslims are no different. They're like, what is that? They're coming up to me, like, Shaykh, is, are, are they somebody good? Or are they somebody bad? Like, we don't get it. We see the name of Islam everywhere, but what's going on with these people? How are we supposed to look at it? We're totally confused. So we educated to the best of our ability, our youth, our broader audiences, our congregations, and we piece by piece deconstructed the narrative that these people are presenting. Now many people ask, where did these guys come from? And why? And this is a question I've been getting at the end of every, every single one of these presentations. There are different types of people that are affiliated with them. There are the people at the top who are running the show who have obvious political agendas and they're maximizing the use of the name of Islam and the texts of Islam for their purpose. Then you have 
people who have suffered damages and great loss at the as a consequence of actions carried out by Western countries. People whose families have been wiped out. People who've lost everything. People who had to deal with civil war for four years in Iraq after America finished bombing it. These are people who have suffered first-hand losses. They, just like you and I would, will fight against anything affiliated with that group that we feel is responsible for the loss of our loved ones. You and I are no different, believe me. If somebody came and shot out your whole family, bombed your whole neighborhood, you would not be sending them roses in the mail. You'd want to see them crushed, destroyed, finished forever. And while I'm talking about the problems of violent extremism, don't think for one second that I'm here to endorse the actions of Western countries or that I agree with Western foreign policy. That's another subject for another day. There are serious, serious problems. When countries say peace from one side of their mouth and then give issues to launch bombs and massive attacks on the other side of their mouth. There's a serious problem with that. And that brings us to the third category of people that are involved. These are people who are sick and tired of the hypocrisy. I'm not justifying what they're doing. I'm telling you this is what is playing through the minds of people. We talk about people being radicalized. Who are the first people being radicalized? It's these people. They say, what? Did they just do that again? Did they just go into another country and bomb the heck out of it? Did they just declare everyone as a terrorist? They're sick and tired of it. And then there is the fourth group of people who are probably just looking for adventure. And they saw some glossy ISIS magazine or some fancy recruitment clip and they said, wow, that looks like the real deal, man. You get to hold guns. That's awesome. And get to be a Mujahid and you get the 72 virgins and the whole package. That's awesome. So you got these guys as well. You have different levels of people. What we are trying to do is educate people about using peaceful means to achieve peaceful objectives. Let's just say for the sake of argument that it's all wrong. Everything that's being done to handle this is wrong. We are not going to try to change it through violence. If we think that changes are needed, we will bring about those changes through the right channels. We will use diplomacy. We will enter into the government and try to voice our opinions there. In the parliament. We will try to increase awareness. We will use peaceful activism. We will use the internet to, to teach people, to educate people. We will use peaceful and legal means to achieve our objectives and to bring about change. Because there is no other way, there is no other acceptable way to bring about change. You cannot fight crime by becoming a criminal yourself. Imagine if the police said, you know what? There's a lot of gang violence out there. We're just going to go and start killing these bastards. That's it. Because they're causing such a big trouble. So some policeman goes, you know, takes his rifle and just starts firing away. No, you just added another crime to that, to that whole scenario. So we don't want that. And yes, it's difficult. Sometimes it's the most difficult thing to do. But often in life, the right things are the ones that are the most difficult. So we want to immunize our youth against the propaganda of ISIS. We want to inoculate them. And we want our narrative, the narrative of mainstream Muslims across the world, 1.6 billion of us, to be the narrative that's heard by Muslims and non-Muslims. We don't want 
the narrative of a rogue group influencing the minds of innocent youngsters who are growing up just like anyone else in Canada or in any other country. And so, this seminar, this program was just one link in that chain of events. There are a lot of things that we have planned. We are trying to create a template that we can implement across other provinces as well. Just on the way here, just before I, I pulled in, I was getting calls from the media and they're saying, so we want to know about how the, how the campaign is going on and this and that. And what do you have to say about you know, youngsters from other, uh, from other provinces that are going and joining these groups and so on and so forth. So there's obviously a need to take this message across, across the country. So thank you so much for attending and being such a, a great and attentive audience. And um, it's a pleasure, it's been a pleasure working on this campaign. We are very fortunate to have partners like the ones that we do from the RCMP. We're working with these guys on almost a daily basis. And they have been there not as policemen, believe me. This is a completely different kind of police work that our communities have never seen before. It's partnering up with the community. It's showing support. It's being there when you need to be there. And that means more to us than anything else. And we, we in return, are trying to be there for them and give them the support and reach out to our people. And I think that it's these types of partnerships that will mitigate the harms and the evils of society. And without these partnerships, we can't succeed. And I also want to acknowledge the effort that has been put in by some of our government representatives, some of our MPs, like Ginny Sims particularly, from Surrey Newton, she's been outstanding. She's voiced our opinion in the parliament, she's given exposure to this campaign, and she has appointed her office to be working with us again on a day-to-day -day basis. And so it is not a one-man or one, one organization uh, show. This is a partnership of people across Canadian society that want to see positive change come about and want to prevent things from happening. So again, thank you very much, and we look forward to seeing you again in other programs.